On May 4th, after the Six Days Campaign, his defeat in the Battle of Paris, Napoleon would abdicate his rule and King Louis XVIII would be restored to the French throne. Subsequently, Napoleon would be exiled to Elba, a tiny island off the coast of modern-day Italy. Following France's defeat, the four great powers of Europe at the time, Prussia, Austria, Russia, and Britain, would meet at the Congress of Vienna, where their conflicting demands would bring them to the verge of war. This, along with the news of French resentment against the newly instated king and returning nobility, would probably inspire the still ambitious Napoleon on returning to France. As after spending only 10 months on the island, he would escape on February 26, 1815. While his British and French guard ships were absent, he would sail a small fleet and arrive with a thousand men near the French town of Cannes. Throughout France, he would be warmly received and his troop numbers would swell rapidly. Napoleon returned while the Congress of Vienna was sitting on the 13th of March, seven days before Napoleon reached Paris. The powers at the Congress of Vienna declared him an outlaw and with the signing of this declaration, so began the War of the Seventh Coalition. The hopes of peace that Napoleon had entertained were gone, as war was now inevitable. The further treaty, the Treaty of Alliance against Napoleon, was ratified on March 25th, in which each of the great European powers pledged 150,000 men for the coming conflict. Napoleon would regain his political and military power as Louis XVIII would flee to the Netherlands. Napoleon, having to turn his attention immediately to the powers of the Seventh Coalition, would split his forces into three main armies. First, he placed an army in the south near the Alps. This army was to stop any Austrian advances through Italy. Secondly, he placed an army on the French-Prussian border where he hoped to defeat any Prussian attacks. And the army of the north, under Napoleon's direct control, was placed on the border with the Netherlands to defeat the British, Dutch, and Prussian forces if they dared attack. Some time after the Allies began mobilizing, it was agreed that the planned invasion of France was to commence on July 1st, 1815, even though the British Army under Wellington and the Prussian Army under Blücher were ready much earlier. The advantage of this delayed invasion date was that it allowed the invading coalition armies a chance to be ready at the same time. They could deploy their combined numerically superior forces against Napoleon's smaller, thinly spread forces, thus ensuring his defeat. Napoleon now had to decide whether to fight a defensive or offensive campaign. Defense would entail repeating the 1814 campaign in France, but with much larger troops at his disposal. Napoleon would choose to attack, which entailed a preemptive strike at his enemies, for they were fully able to assemble and cooperate by destroying some of the major coalition armies. Napoleon believed he would then be able to bring the governments of the 7th coalition to the peace table to discuss terms favorable for France, with himself remaining in power at its head. Napoleon's decision to attack in Belgium was supported by several considerations. First, he had learned that the British and Prussian armies were widely dispersed and might be defeated separately. Further, the British troops in Belgium were largely second-line troops. Most of the veterans of the Peninsula War had been sent to America to fight the War of 1812, and politically, a French victory might trigger a friendly revolution in French-speaking Belgium. Napoleon would move his 128,000-strong army of the north to the Belgian frontier, position just south of the Sambre River, where he would draw up two different plans of invasion, one being through the Mons and the other being through Charleroi. Historians debate whether the invasion plan through the Mons was actually considered by Napoleon, whether it was simply just a ruse to throw off spies in Paris. Either way, Napoleon's plan would work, as Wellington would take the bait and would expect Napoleon to try to envelop the coalition armies by moving through the Mons into the west of Brussels. Wellington feared that such a move would cut his communications with the ports he relied on for supply, and on June 15th, Napoleon would cross the Sombre and would capture Charleroi in relative secrecy. Wellington would order his army to concentrate around the divisional headquarters, but was still unsure whether the attack on Charleroi was a feint and the main assault would come through the Mons. Wellington only determining Napoleon's true intentions with certainty in the evening, and his orders for his army to muster near Quatre Bras were sent out just before midnight. The Prussian general's staff seemed to have divined the French army's intent rather more accurately. The Prussians were not surprised as on June 13th, Blücher had already begun to concentrate his forces. Napoleon considered the Prussians a greater threat, and so moved against them first, with the right wing of his army and the reserves. Napoleon would place Marshal Ney in command of the French left wing, and order him to secure the crossroads at Quatre Bras 
towards which Wellington was hastily gathering his dispersed army. Napoleon, having pushed a wedge between Wellington and Blücher at Charleroi, would divide his army into three parts. The left wing, consisting of one infantry corps and two cavalry divisions, stood under the command of Marshal Ney. The right wing, two cavalry corps under Marshal Grouchy, and the center, three infantry corps, and the fourth cavalry corps as a reserve under the command of Napoleon. Napoleon's most important goal consisted of keeping the two armies separated and striking each individually. For this purpose, Ney would move against the Anglo allies at Quatre Bras and hold Wellington's forces there. At the same time, the French under Napoleon would attack the Prussians at Ligny. Ney's orders were to secure the crossroads at Quatre Bras so that he could later swing east and reinforce Napoleon if needed. Ney found the crossroads of Quatre Bras lightly held by the Prince of Orange, who repelled Ney's initial attacks, but was gradually driven back by overwhelming numbers of French troops. First reinforcements, and then Wellington arrived, he would take over command and drive Ney back. Securing the crossroads by early evening, too late to send help to the Prussians who had already been defeated. Meanwhile, on the 16th of June, Napoleon attacked and defeated Blücher's Prussian army at Ligny. Using part of the reserve in the right wing of his army, the Prussian center gave way under heavy French assaults. The Prussian retreat from Ligny went uninterrupted and seemingly unnoticed by the French. The bulk of their rear guard units held their position until about midnight, and some elements did not move out until the following morning. Crucially, the Prussians did not retreat to the east along their own lines of communication. Instead, they fell back northwards parallel to Wellington, still remaining within supporting distance and in communication with him throughout. The Prussians would rally in a strong position south of Wavre. With the Prussian retreat from Ligny, Wellington's position at Quatre Bras was no longer viable. The next day, he withdrew northwards to a defensive position on the low ridge of Mont Saint-Jean, south of the village of Waterloo. Napoleon, with the reserves, made a late start on the 17th of June and joined Ney at Quatre Bras to attack Wellington's army, but found the position empty. The French pursued Wellington's retreating army to Waterloo. However, due to bad weather, mud, and the head start that Napoleon's tardy advance had allowed Wellington, there was no substantial engagement. Before leaving Ligny, Napoleon had ordered Grouchy, who commanded the right wing, to follow up the retreating Prussians with 33,000 men. A late start, uncertainty about the directions the Prussians had taken, and the vagueness of the orders given to him meant that Grouchy was too late to prevent the Prussian army from reaching Wavre, but from where it could march to support Wellington. More importantly, the heavily outnumbered Prussian rearguard was able to use the River Dile to enable a savage and prolonged action to delay Grouchy. As the 17th of June, drew to a close, Wellington's army had arrived at its position at Waterloo, the main body of Napoleon's army following. Blücher's army was gathering in and around Wavre, around eight miles to the east of the town. Early on the morning of the 18th, Wellington received an assurance from Blücher that the Prussian army would support him. He decided to hold his ground and give battle at Waterloo. The Waterloo position was a strong one. It consisted of a long ridge running east to west, perpendicular to the main road to Brussels. Along the crest of the ridge ran the Ohain Road, a deep sunken lane. Wellington deployed his infantry in a line just behind the crest of the ridge following the Ohain Road. The length of the battlefield was also relatively short, at two and a half miles. This allowed Wellington to draw his forces in depth, which he did in the center and on the right, in expectation that the Prussians would reinforce his left during the day. In front of the ridge, there were three positions that could be fortified. On the extreme right, the chateau, garden, and orchard of the Hougamont. This was a large and well-built country house, initially hidden in trees. The house faced north, along which it could be supplied on the extreme left was the hamlet of Papalote. Both Higumont and Papalote were fortified and garrisoned, and thus anchored Wellington's flanks securely. Papalote also commanded the road to Wavre that the Prussians would use to send reinforcements to Wellington's position. On the west side of the main road and in front of the rest of Wellington's line was the farmhouse and orchard of La Haye Sente, which was garrisoned with 400 light infantry of the King's German Legion. On the opposite side of the road was a disused sand quarry where the 95th rifles were posted as sharpshooters. Wellington's forces positioning presented a formidable challenge to any attacking force. Any attempt to turn Wellington's right would entail taking the entrenched Hougamont position. Any attack on his right center would mean the attackers would have to march between musket fire from Hougamont and La Haye Sente. 
on the left, any attack would be taking musket fire La Haye Santa in its adjoining sand pit, and any attempt to turn on the left flank would entail fighting through the lanes and hedgerows surrounding Papalote and other garrison buildings on that flank. The French army would form on the slopes of another ridge to the south. In the right rear of the French position was a sustainable village of Placenon. Napoleon would delay the start of the battle, owing it to the sodden ground, which would have made maneuvering cavalry and artillery difficult. But at around 11.30, the battle would begin when French troops would launch an attack on Wellington's right flank at Hougoumont. The initial attack would make some progress, but was driven back by heavy British artillery fire. As the British guns were distracted by a duel with French artillery, a second attack would succeed in reaching the north gate of the house. The French would break the gate open with an axe, and some French troops managed to enter the courtyard, but ultimately, the French would fail to take the farm. The 80 guns of Napoleon's Grand Battery would open fire at around midday. The battery was too far back to aim accurately, and the only other troops they could see were the British skirmishers, as the rest of Wellington's army was deploying Wellington's reverse slope defense. The bombardment still caused a large number of casualties, although some projectiles buried themselves in the soft soil most found their mark on the reverse slope of the ridge. At around 1.30, Napoleon would send his infantry to attack against Wellington's left wing. They still encountered stiff resistance from the British, but the British line was slowly dispersing. At this crucial point, Wellington would order the British cavalry, formed unseen behind the ridge, to charge the French in support of the hard-pressed infantry. The British cavalry would smash through the French lines as the French attack disintegrated. French infantry would begin fleeing for their lives as they were rowed down by British horsemen, but the British, overcome by their successful charge, would ride too far and end up in range of the French musketry and artillery fire, which would quickly cut down the British horsemen. With the British cavalry now in a dire state, they would be countercharged by French cavalry and suffer staggering losses. A little before four, Ney noted an apparent exodus of Wellington Center. He mistook the movement of casualties to the rear for the beginnings of a retreat and sought to exploit it. Ney had few infantry reserves left, as most of the infantry had been committed to either the futile Hougoumont assault or to the defense of the French right. Ney therefore tried to break Wellington Center with cavalry alone. Wellington Center responded by forming hollow square formations. Infantry squares were deadly to cavalry, as cavalry cannot charge with soldiers behind a hedge of bayonets, but were themselves vulnerable to fire from the squares. Thus, Ney's inability to back up his assault with infantry would be costly. Eventually, it would become obvious to Ney that cavalry alone were achieving little. Belatedly, he organized a combined arms attack. This assault was directed along much of the same route as the previous heavy cavalry attacks between Hougoumont and La Haye Santa. It was halted by a charge of the British cavalry. However, the British cavalry were unable to break the French infantry as they would fall back after taking heavy losses from musketry fire. However, the French attack would eventually be driven back by heavy British artillery fire at approximately the same time as Ney's combined arms assault on the right side of Wellington's line. The French renewed the attack on La Haye Sainte and this time were successful, the fortifications being captured. Ney then moved skirmishers and horse artillery up towards Wellington Center. French artillery would immediately begin to pulverize the infantry squares at short range, cutting through the closely packed formations, making Wellington's position turn dire. But Napoleon's position was also troublesome, as the Prussians now began arriving in mass. Blucher's objective was Plus saint -Nord, which the Prussians intended to use as a springboard into the rear of the French positions. Napoleon would dispatch men to hold against the Prussians, but they would be forced to retreat to Plus saint -Nord, driving them past the rear of the French right flank and directly threatening its only line of retreat. Napoleon had dispatched all eight battalions of the Young Guard to reinforce Plus saint -Nord, where they were now seriously pressed. The Young Guard would counterattack and after very hard fighting, secured Plus saint -Nord but were themselves counterattacked and driven out. Napoleon would in turn send more men into Plossignon, and after fierce bayonet fighting, they would recapture the village. Napoleon, with his army on the brink of collapse, would send his famed Imperial Guard to attack the weakened British center. British would fight fiercely, and eventually fix bayonets and charge. This would waver the Imperial Guards, and eventually force an all-out retreat. Following this, Prussians would recapture Plossignon. The French right, left, and center had all now failed. The last cohesive French force consisted of two battalions of the Old Guard. They had been placed to act as a final reserve and to protect Napoleon in event of a French retreat. He hoped to rally the French army behind them, but as retreat turned into rout, they too were forced to withdraw, with Napoleon narrowly managing to escape capture. On the 19th of June, 
General Grouchy, still following his orders, defeated General Thaliman at Wavre and withdrew in good order. Waterloo cost Wellington around 17,000 dead or wounded and Blucher some 7,000. Napoleon's losses were 26,000 killed or wounded, including a some 6,000 captured, then additional 15,000 deserting subsequently to the battle and over the following days. With the defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon's political situation became more difficult and his military situation became impossible as Napoleon would announce his second abdication on the 24th of June, 1815. And on June 28th, the coalition governments would place King Louis XVIII back on the French throne yet again, and Napoleon would be exiled to St. Helena, where he would die six years later on May 5th, 1821. Thank you for watching our video on Napoleon's Waterloo campaign. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing. And as always, thank you for watching The Knowledge Show.